Hi, I'm Ron Simpson, N6GKJ. I am uh, an amateur TV enthusiast. I'm a member of Lodi Amateur Radio Club and a director uh, of uh, net operations and actively involved in the repeater committee for the Lodi Club as well as back-end support for uh, Mount Diablo Amateur Radio Club. I'm not a club member but a lot of my input and ideas <clears throat> help make this all happen. I don't know how well you can see that because I'm asking you, don't be scared by the image, okay? I haven't taken my Halloween mask off yet from last year. What we're looking at right there is a live digital capture of my transmitter, which is set up over there. And in that particular program, I'm running vMix. I'm not running the Linux, I'm running Windows 10 on that running a program called DMix, and they give you options of <clears throat> having this news reader things on the bottom like the you see on CNN and, and news stations. So I just put that up there as a, uh, some cool things you can do with it. And you know about that, Stan. You've <clears throat> played with that. Okay. What we're going to be talking about in this presentation is... Uh, what is digital amateur television? How many of you guys are here for the class this morning with Joel? All right, that's cool, most of you guys. Uh, Joel touched on um, ATV and there's a primer intro. I'm not gonna go into deep level stuff like he did. Mine is gonna be more of a, what do I gotta do to get on the air and what's it cost and what do I need and where can I get it and stuff like that. We're not gonna worry about um, the kind of stuff that Joel talked about. But there is some overlap there. Uh, then we're going to ask, uh, what do we use ATV for? Why do we need to have our face broadcast out all over the place? It can get very entertaining. We see dogs, cats, airplanes, buzzards chasing airplanes, and sometimes some really cool stuff when they get Freddy gets his camera zoomed right down on a circuit board. You can see what's going on. Uh, the modes, what modes can we use? We covered that a little bit this morning. I'll go into more in depth about that. And the spectrum available. Why we chose DVB-S. Joel talked about that. That's very important, why we chose DVB. Uh, what gear do we use? How do I transmit DA, you know, TV? And what kind of power is needed with DVB-S? And then finally, uh, repeater operation and simplex for ATV. So, digital amateur television is, DATV is that, digital amateur television. It is the next phase, step in the progression, the migration, the ev evolving of, of amateur television. During the 90s, satellite TV was beginning to become popular with the masses. Remember when they were selling those prime star dishes, a dime a dozen? Well, it wasn't long before us hands are going, hmm, how do we do that? Well, a lot of research went into this. Primarily it was in Europe because the Europeans are the ones who developed all the satellite standards. We're 25 years behind those guys. When Joel was talking about the Bat C Group, British Amateur Television Club, they literally are the guys that wrote the book on this stuff. I've got some friends that live over there, and their involvement in what is really what that little box was designed by them. We'll talk about that. Uh, this was at a time where AM was king. Everybody had AM because that's all there was. And so a lot of money was spent on AM, being, buying quality broadcast cameras, uh, building the finest uh, video interface that you could get. Uh, AM, is a, AM is AM. You take your modulated signal, you feed it to an, an amplifier, and you got AM. You do it with voice, you can do it with television. So that's what we did. But you couldn't get a good picture every single time. And you're constantly fiddling with the knobs. How many of you guys did AM TV? You know what I'm talking about is a constant adjust the pedestal, adjust the brightness level, and cross your fingers and hope for the best. 
And then so you're thinking, wow, I'm cool for school. So I look at my monitor and I adjust my picture and I get a beautiful picture over here. And everybody else is going, man, your picture sucks. You got to fix it. Well, it looks good to me. Well, that's a problem with AM because you, you adjust it to what you see. Uh, a lot of guys didn't run duplex on AM TV because they just didn't have what it takes to do it. So they didn't know what they're looking at. And even guys who had uh, video monitors where they could actually look at the video signal off a demodulated uh, input still didn't get it right. So even though those tools were available, it was kind of hokey. So uh, Mount Diablo Amateur Radio Club had a powerhouse station on, uh, on Mount Diablo running 427-250. That was the cable channel 58 that uh, Joel talked about. That was a, like a 200 watt amplifier, huge. We're getting 80 watts clean video out of that thing. So you know, that was a, a pretty big thing. And the area that it captured was all of Northern California. It, the bigger antenna you had, the farther away you could get from it. A lot of us guys eventually moved on to FM. The signal to noise ratio of FM is unbelievable compared to AM. Uh, AM, it took a lot of effort to put in what we call a P5 picture, which is perfect video picture quality. It's almost unheard of in amateur TV. FM, it was like P5 all the time. And you didn't need to run that much power to do it. But the problem with FM, it's this big, which means you're going from an AM signal like this to an FM signal like that. You don't have as many channel spaces to use. It's, it, the cost of that signal improvement was bandwidth. So the video, recovered video on the other end, you gave up bandwidth to do it. And that caused problems at one point too because where do you fit 17 megs of spectrum without causing somebody else interference? We can't do that. We can't blow people up that way. So it's, it's a touchy thing. About 2005, the, uh, oops, can't do that. 2005, the push in Europe was to get on digital ATV. I talked to some people over there. They experimented with DVB-T and DVB-S. You asked the question this morning, why don't we use DVB-T? It's too expensive. You can buy stuff on eBay cheap, 25, 30 bucks. Try to find stuff for, that will support DVB-T. Now you're talking big money. He's an island. He's a one guy thing. Europe is not supporting him because it's a, it's a one off. And when he goes out of business, there's no support. It's expensive stuff. It's three, 300 bucks for his transmitter or a little more, maybe $400. And it doesn't play well with the other kids in the neighborhood. Okay. What we're trying to do is we're trying to follow what the Europeans are doing. And the reason we're doing that is all of the cool software for all the SDR stuff that's up and coming is coming from those guys. Like I said, they're light years ahead of what we do. Why should we reinvent the wheel? Um, I played with DVB-T and after spending $700 just to get my transmit stream up and running, I could never find a receiver that would work right with it. And the bandwidth on that, the particular station that I was playing with, was 8 megahertz. Well, that kind of defeats the purpose right there. Now I'm bigger than the AM signal. And so when I did manage to drop down to 7 megahertz, I'm still bigger than the AM signal. So I'm going the wrong way. So we decided in Northern California, we're going to focus on DVB-S. There are pros and cons to both. Um, but all that satellite gear stuff that's out there was all DVB-S and it started showing up cheap on the market. So we're hams. Do we want to spend big money when we don't have to? No. So DVB-S is amazing. You wouldn't think that it works in some of the ways that it does, but the guys that are on the air right now can tell you they're not running a lot of power. Some of us don't have good line of sight to the hill and we can still see a very good recovered picture. So I've just been that. Uh, there's a French ham that I talked to, 
F4DAY, speaks terrible English. He built something called the Poor Man's Digital ATV Transmitter. That is the predecessor to the DATV Express Board that a lot of the guys in Northern California are running right now. Uh, another ham by the name of Rob Swinbank, M0DTS, took that board, designed something called the Digilite Transmitter, which is what we're running on Mount, uh, Bear Mountain, and then that board eventually morphed into something else too. Anyway, I, I finally did get some surplus stuff from Joel back in 2007, got it on the air and said, wow, this is some pretty amazing stuff, and, and I got hooked. So uh, jumping back here to 2009, the Digilite transmitter came along. I have some pictures of that coming up. Uh, I built one, Fred built one, Fred Co. WB6ASU, for those of you who know him. The system consisted of that pile of stuff right there, a laptop, a transmitter board and a video capture device. As you can see, that is as portable as I've been able to make my station. I can grab that and go, but now I got this big honky mess to deal with. So uh, that's what we call a DATV Express transmitter, and actually it's pretty cool. Considering it operates from 50 megahertz to 2500 megahertz just by programming it from the front panel GUI. But the thing is, is that particular version right there uh, originally was designed to run in Linux. Everybody seems to not want to get involved with Linux, but it's not really that bad. Bob, did you have much trouble getting yours? First time up. First time up. And Bob is running a unique thing. He's running in something called an Odroid. He's waiting for it to come out and attack him one of these days which is not even a computer like this. It's a thing that looks like a Raspberry Pi and he puts in a beautiful picture at Mount Diablo. Anyway, that DT, DATV Express transmitter was selling for about $300. If you stop and look at what it does and the amount of bands that you have available, you've got 433, 900, and 1.2 all in one box. And if you're really good, you can get 2.3 out of it, but I've never been able to get a decent picture at 2.3 because the amplifier just doesn't quite put out enough drive up that high. Um, unfortunately, that DATV Express board has reached its end of life, and we're working with them right now, the people who are building it, to try to get them to, to keep producing it, but we'll see how it goes. Uh, we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. And what do we use ATV for? We use ATV to communicate with, just like HF or FM. We hold nets on the ATV repeater every Thursday night. There are tech, tech nets on Tuesday nights. Uh, we goof off a lot. Um, you can hold a simplex contest for distance and the number of station worked. I don't think anybody here has done that yet. It's big in Europe. And we also put transmitters in balloons, helicopters, quads, uh, little radio controlled quad vehicles, uh, drones, and uh, RC airplanes. And there's a really cool video one of our guys did. He's flying this electric airplane around his field above his house and the birds are chasing his plane. Big ones, buzzards. It's one of the best videos out there. We do use ATV for disaster support. In the 80s, Stockton, uh, one of the levees broke. I don't know if any of you guys remember that, but it flooded south part of Stockton. And uh, in 1984, they didn't have live shot trucks like they do now. They had to record everything to tape, take it to the station, compile it, and get it on the air. We put a, a black and white camera on a sheriff helicopter with a 433 transmitter, and they were able to fly over the area and watch the video at the incident command center. They thought we were like heroes for that. To us, it was, oh, cool, we get to play with our ATV some more. So that's the kind of stuff that can be done with it. Um, we can talk to the uh, International Space Station with digital TV because they have all this stuff up there to receive and transmit digital signal. They spent thousands of dollars to build this homemade box, and when you look at it, the switches don't even line up in a row. They're kind of like, you know, somebody missed the marked things when they did it. But ATV is fun. It's very enjoyable. I've enjoyed it over the years. If you are a builder, you like to build stuff, 
This is a good way for you to spend your time and your money. <laughs> you literally see the efforts of your results. And to quote one of our famous ATV guys, if you're not on ATV, you are just not getting the picture. <laughs> you know who I'm talking about, right, Stan? John says that all the time on the net. So it's, it's kind of fun. We have uh, several modes, AM, FM, DVB-S, DVB-T, and DVB-C. Uh, DVB-C is cable TV. There's no support for am amateur radio on that whatsoever. It's not really interfaceable to what we do because of the way the equipment they have is designed. The DVB-T is terrestrial mode. It's primarily used in uh, South America, Central America, and the, and the Pacific Asian markets where you got a lot of jungle terrain. It does use something called COFDM, which is kind of like what, how Wi-Fi works. Same type of topography. Uh, it's really great for um, uh, eliminating multicast, multi-hop interference. You know, you get rid of multi-path with it, just not seem to be affected by it. Then you've got FM, which is, we'll get into that. AM is technically the simplest of all modes. You take a transmitter feed video signal, the final, just like with an AM HF rig, and you have to have special circuitry in there. You have to be able to set the video drive level so you don't overdrive the PA. You gotta make sure your brightness is right, your sound is right. All kinds of stuff goes into keeping your AM <coughs> station looks good. Uh, in the old days, before cable 58, we had down converters and we watched it on channel three or four, just like your home video game. Cable 58 came along, TVs had it in there, we switched over to it and then it was no more down converter. <coughs> and we chose 58 because it's 427, 250. Right there in the handbands, right where NARC and the ARRL said where we should be. <clears throat> so I think they are reading the tea leaves when they wrote that part of the band plan. They did something right. Unfortunately, because of pave pause, you guys saw that big ugly thing with a round disc in it that's up at Beale Air Force Base. We had to abandon that 427 frequency. And we moved over to 1241.250 AM. Still running a big amplifier, about 80 watts, same power, different band, reduced footprint. As you go up in frequency, your effective coverage goes down because of that too. <coughs> Most guys ran the PC electronics transmitters. The cost was about three to 450, depending on if you got a good deal on some used stuff or you bought it brand new. There again, you're using up six megahertz with a band space. <coughs> FM was cheap, 70 bucks for an FM transmitter and 70 bucks for an FM receiver. That's cheap. Unfortunately, again, you're this wide, but you did have stereo sound if you wanted it. So what we did is we <clears throat> ran sound on one channel and PL on the other because the receiver on the hill was PL protected to reduce interference from other stations. Um, <clears throat> All you had to do is plug your, your camera video and sound in. No adjustments. You might have had to make a light, slight little tweak on the video input that's on the board to adjust to your camera, and that was it. You're on the air. Um, you could run that at 910, 915, or 1200. The higher you go up in frequency, the more it costs only because amplifiers cost more. Um, how many of you guys know what a max track radio is? I know Mike does over there. <clears throat> well, I used to get those 900 meg trunking max track radios off eBay for 15 bucks. Take the boards out of them, throw them away, and put the, uh, the Comtech FM transmitter in one because 50 milliwatts out of the Comtech drove that max track PA berserk. And it would put out 15 watts FM at 900 megs. And so. <laughs> You know, for less than 100 bucks, you're on the air with an FM transmitter. And there's still FM on Mount Diablo. It works real well. There's still guys using it. Uh, there is no 915 up there. We had a problem that I think it was environmental. Those uh, receivers have an IF at 481 megs, and I think it was seeing the monster signal on channel 14 on the other hill is why that receiver up there didn't work. 
<coughs> so again, 17 megs. Well, DVBS is generally a single transport stream, except with what Joel has done, where we put multiple transport streams on there. Using a forward error correction system using Reed Solomon. That was mentioned earlier. That is a two week seminar just to figure out what they're doing with Reed Sol Solomon. So we're not going to discuss it other than the intervals that we can use are one, one half, two thirds, three quarter, which is actually one, two, two, three, three, four, five, six, and seven, eight. And that has to do with the ratio of actual data bits that you're transmitting. Uh, I think one, two, isn't it? Half of the data bits have to have, be real data in order for the Solomon read stream to uh, figure out what's missing if it needs any of that. Uh, the modulation scheme is generally QPSK. It can be other uh, with interleaving. The video and audio are transported by way of MPEG-2. And that gets in that little box over there. We'll talk about that. Uh, DVB-T is generally used in terrestrial broadcasting, as I said, Central and South America, as well as Pacific Asian areas. MPEG-2 or MPEG-4 can be used as a transport stream choice. The method uses COFDM, which I can't remember what COFDM is. Fre orthogonal frequency right, or Wi-Fi channel N, same, same type of thing, uses that. Um, it, what it does is it breaks the data up into data blocks and it makes a carrier at, at about, what, one kilohertz apart. And so you got 1,700 carriers right there in that spectrum that's carrying all this data. That's why it's, it has this multipath uh, resistance uh, advantage. Other than that, uh, I don't see a whole lot there after, after having played with it. The system does employ a guard band. And that's kind of like a channel separator block that keeps the receiver from seeing the next guy over. Uh, system's a little more immune to multipath, but the transmitter PA requirements are a little tighter. More care needs to be taken in keeping the transmitter signals from exploding into wideband mess. Bandwidth is generally locked at 7 or 8 megs. And DVBC, commonly cable TV, there's, like I said, there's virtually no support there. That's my FM transmitter that I built. That's the, uh, the front side. I had a power switch and a transmit switch. And then the back side, they're just simply, the yellow one is the video, the white one is the aural, and the end connector is the output. That transmitter right there will run 35 watts all day long without even thinking about it. Excuse me, is this online? Um, it will be. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, what spectrum can we use? In the continental U.S., we are granted TV privileges in the 426 through 433 spectrum, 900 meg handband, and 1.2 gig and up. There are a few systems in Northern California that amateur operators can use because of the FCC rules. We are limited to how much bandwidth we can occupy for certain modes in certain frequency spectrums, and mainly that... Uh, is a lot to do with our frequency coordinating body, NARC, Northern Amateur Radio Relay Council. They said, well, you can have this chunk of spectrum here and this one here, and oh, we'll put you between the repeater input and output on 1.2. Well, <laughs> that didn't work out so good. Um, typically, um, the AM stuff is run at 426 because we have a 6 meg channel spacing there. It was a natural thing to put there. Um, we can easily put, you know, a two and a half meg wide DVB signal in there. But right now, the FCC doesn't really give us clear definition if that's a legal mode or not. Now, I just found out after having listened to Laura, uh, what's her name, Laura Smith, that they're changing it, where they're going to drop the baud rate stipulation out of how much baud rate or data rate we can run. They do that, and then we're good. So there are guys that are running digital at 433. It's not exactly groovy, but the FCC is not focusing on it. They're kind of looking the other way. In a big operation like MDARC, I seriously doubt they're going to expose themselves to any kind of issue. So we'll see what happens on that front. 
Uh, 900 megs is typically been FM. You can run AM up there. We've done it. it it's a homebrew thing. It doesn't really turn out that well. And you can buy the $70 ComTech board that's programmable, 900 or 1200. And I, I've got some pictures of that a little bit later. I'll show you too. But again, depending on your oral carrier offsets, you can be at five megs, five and a half, six, or six and a half megs, depending on how you tune them. And you're anywhere from 14 megs, like up to 17, 18 megs. Well, we don't we don't want to be that wide. And um, if you've got space to do it, you're fine. The problem with 900, uh, how many of you guys own a 900 meg home phone or had one? You know that it got interfered with all the time. There's baby monitors, other cordless phones. Uh, 900 meg Wi-Fi is, is uh, invading our space up there. And so it's, it's not really a good choice. Uh, that leaves us, we're uh, coming up to... 1.2 gigs. Well, we used to have a lot of spectrum up there, free and clear. Guess what happened? PavePause came along, kicked everybody off of UHF, and they went to 900 and 1.2 to put up their repeaters, and now all that spectrum is talk trash by people who just want to talk. If I want to talk, I want to see. Can't do that too much anymore. It's, it's kind of uh, nerve-wracking. So uh, there's there's, uh, what we used to do in the old days is we'd take the C-band uh, receivers, because they had the output on L-band, 1.2 gig, and uh, tweak them a little bit, the IF. So we'd narrowed up the IF, and all of a sudden, wow, we got really good pictures. Or you can use a dedicated ComTech receiver to receive the FM stuff. Again, 70 bucks. Um, you do nothing to them other than plug them in, and you plug it into power, plug it into your monitor, and, and you're on the air. So both of those uh, receivers, the C-band FM receiver and the ComTech use AV out. And, you know, that's, that's that. We do pretty much the same thing at 1.2 as we do for 900. At frequencies higher than 1.2 gig, we use down converters. It's the only way to get there. Now, the interesting thing about the 3.4 gig ham band, that is C band. There are a ton of LNB block converters out there with very good performance specs for $9. So you take one of those, you put it on your dish network dish, you point it at the hill, and all of a sudden you're receiving C band. Well, there is going to be a C band transmitter eventually. The parts have been bought. Most of the transmitter's been built, but it hasn't been blessed by the, the powers that be to have it put up there yet. But we're working on them. And that will hopefully eventually find its way to, to Mount Diablo. It certainly will find its way to, to Bear Mountain. For the receivers, we use these cool little $35 boxes like Joel showed us earlier. Sometimes you can find them cheaper than that on eBay. Uh, cost is a big factor with digital TV. You want to spend your money wisely. Where you're going to spend your money really is in your antenna system. That is what is going to give you the most bang for your buck. Just like in normal radio communications, you can only talk to what you can hear. And if your antenna can't hear it, you're not going to do that much. So, <coughs> excuse me, antenna system is where I focus my, my attention. Um, the equipment is getting better all the time and they have HDMI output to your modern home TV so you can have a really nice picture to look at and uh, it's very clean and very sharp. That's a 1.2 gig filter that I built <clears throat> for uh, being able to duplex. That filter is 30 to 40 hours worth of work. There's a lot of holes that have to be drilled and tapped in that thing. And my wife was coming unglued because I had this cardboard out in the middle of the kitchen table and I'm doing all this and she's coming unglued because she thought I was going to get shavings and cutting oil and everything else all over her tablecloth there. Fortunately for me, I'm still alive so you know that didn't happen. That's my performance specs of that filter that I just showed you. 
You really probably can't see it, but that is 1.6 dB insertion loss on that filter. And as you can see, these are 10 mag steps from 43. So that's 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. At 50 dB down, um, 10, 20, 30, oops, I didn't want to do that. Um, the, the, the skirts aren't bad. Uh, 1260 over here on the far end is just at the baseline. So this filter will work real well for keeping the 1292 transmitter out of it. That was a culmination of 30 to 40 hours worth of drilling, tapping, and tuning. That is the input SWR, the return loss of that filter. It's virtually the same on each end of the filter. I've never seen a filter, commercially built or amateur built, that the return loss is the same on each end of the filter. They're just not. Don't know why, I think it's machining, building, but I can tell you there is nothing precision about that filter. There's gaps that have angled cuts where Fred didn't exactly cut the aluminum straight. It is not plated and it's bolted together with uh, stainless steel screws. And each one of those little holes are about an inch apart, so that tells you how big that filter is, about this big. Not precision, that's the result. Can you imagine what it'd be like if it was precision? I don't have that much free time. That vertical line there, about a third of the way down, that represents the uh, 1.5 visoir point. So uh, you can see that that filter is easily below that, uh, even at that point, that peak right there. Most of that filter is below that. So from a performance standpoint, that's a very good filter, even for being home brew. By the way, I've never been able to build two of them that look like that. Not, that just doesn't happen. So why do we choose DVBS? Again, it's the cost. Uh, there's so much cheap stuff on eBay and other sources out there it's, it's so practical, it's not even a debate. You know, why, why try to push a bowling ball straight up a hill? You know, just, sure, there's other modes out there, but who are you going to talk to? If you're the only guy that has DVB-T, you're going to get bored talking to yourself. Everybody else is going to go the cheap, inexpensive way, and, and that's just kind of how it is. Um, it's very easy to receive the repeater on Mount Diablo. The repeater runs at 5 watts out of the filter into the feed line running 7-8 teleaxin with a 15 dB gain omni antenna. The antenna is about 100 feet up on the tower. I think there's probably 20 or 40 feet of feed line between the building and the base of the tower that, where it snakes inside the building. I live in Lodi. So I'm 60 kilometers as the crow flies from Mount Diablo from the top. I do not have line of sight. I cannot see it. Standing on the roof of my house, I cannot see Mount Diablo. My antenna, being up at 25 feet, doesn't see it either. But I easily see the picture at 90% signal quality with a small loop yagi uh, at home. So one day I, I pull my Comet antenna coax in for one, my 1.2 rig, my vertical, which is up about 20 feet, plug it in, and I had 92% signal quality on a vertical with no line of sight. So that tells me that I either got extremely lucky on the receive end, or there's so much signal coming off Mount Diablo that I couldn't hide from it if I wanted to. I think it's the latter. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that there are advantages to running digital. The signal to noise ratio is lower, the bandwidth is lower, so you get more bang for the buck as far as your RF signal level performance is concerned. It's just a, it's just a kind of a win-win all the way around. What gear do we use? Well, you can't just call up um, HRO and order this stuff. They're not going to have it. Uh, many of us use dual antenna system. Uh, Bob, are you running dual antenna or single? Two. The reason we do that is we're vain. We like to see ourselves and hear ourselves when we're talking. Unfortunately, now, 
you got to turn your volume down because that delay, there is a delay, um, 1.8 seconds on Mount Diablo. You start talking and then you hear yourself in the background. And now your timing is out of sync and your, your receiver hears your microphone or vice versa. And it starts going whoop, 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 whoop. And you got to mute it because it just, it'll blow you out of the room. So there's guys writing software right now to delay that. Believe it or not, they're going to take that audio coming out of the monitor, they're going to do a path calculation, and they're going to shoot from the hip, and they're going to try to figure out a way to digitally delay your audio so you don't have that offset there. And they're making some pretty good results. Again, those are the guys in Europe that are doing that. So we kind of want to stay on good speaking terms with them to get their, their cool programs here. Um, you can run one antenna. But if you go to Downey's Microwave and you try to buy an antenna switch that works good up at 1.2, you're going to spend some big bucks. Now you can go to ham swaps and you can get lucky sometimes and find one that actually has good performance, but really that's not always the case. These little SMA connectors, ice relays that you see, and there's a reason that they sell those at ham swaps. Guys that have good ones don't part with them. They're just a kind of a commodity you don't want to get rid of. If you got a good one, you don't want to give it up. So rule of thumb is you see one of those guys selling those, he either has a whole lot of them, he doesn't know what they have, or they're really not that good. So be leery of that. Uh, if you're going to buy it, a uh, reputable firm, Down East Microwave is a, is a good place along with others. <coughs> so you're going to spend a few hundred dollars buying a good switch where you can buy another antenna and another feed line for cheaper than that. A lot of the guys are using the good quality satellite RG6 cable for the receive antenna. But you're looking at 6 dB loss for a 70 foot run of that stuff, so you need to overcome that loss. Preamp is a good way to do it. <coughs> if you're going to run a preamp, you got to put a filter in front of it or the instant you key your transmitter, you're going to blow that little preamp all to pieces. Even though you can buy them for 20 bucks at Lowe's, you don't want to keep doing that. But you can do it, and I've done it, and I've blown out. i got a pile of dead ones at home before I figured that out, by the way. Um, the satellite receivers, as Joel talked about earlier, uh, they put out voltage in many different voltages, 12 volts, 18 volts. And some of those uh, satellites will not allow you, some of those receivers will not allow you to turn off the voltage. Some of them give you a menu option and it still doesn't turn off the voltage. So you got to put a DC block in it or you're going to burn up the radio. It puts 12 volts out, it goes to your grounded antenna system at the top, short circuits, blows the receiver. I haven't been that dumb yet because I knew that would happen. So those DC blocks are four bucks. You can buy them at any place that sells these parts. Um, uh, Fry sells them, Lowe sells them, Home Depot sells them, and the home uh, media installation department off to the electrical department, that's where you can find this stuff. So if you know what to look for, you can get this stuff at pretty good, pretty good prices. <clears throat> like I said, we use inexpensive FTA receivers. I've got old ones and new ones. I've never found one that I couldn't make work yet. So there's uh, some good stuff there. Not all satellite receivers are compatible with what we're doing. If you're going to buy one, look for the branding or the labeling FTA, free to air. Because there are other satellite receivers out there that will not give you the flexibility to reprogram those things the way you want. They're on fixed channels and they're looking for specific things and we break all the rules with ham radio. We do, we do our own thing the way we want it and uh, so stuff that you can tweak is, is the way to go. The receive antennas that I use, um, I do have some ones that I built myself. They're basically a directive system design the aluminum uh, boom mass that I bought was eight foot in length, so instead of chopping it off to six feet, I just drilled extra holes to use the whole boom length. <coughs> we estimated that antenna was about 17 and a half dB gain. But you can buy them brand new, 80 bucks. 
for the 15 dB gain, which is a three foot antenna. Believe it or not, those work. And then uh, the $110 antenna, which is the six foot boom. Of course, the closer you are to Mount Diablo, the uh, smaller the antenna needs to be. And I particularly use the 17 dBi gain model uh, because I'm so far away. The transmitters, that's where we talked about you can't just call up HRO and get the thing shipped out. They're not going to know what you're talking about. This is where listening to somebody who has done it can save you a headache and a grief. There's a lot of experts in this room now, Stan, Bob, Joel, that have actually done this stuff to get their stuff on the air. Um, <coughs> my advice to anybody who wants to do DATV is join the uh, BAT-C group, British Amateur Television Group. It's pretty cheap to be a member of their group. They have an online forum and the discussions they talk about can save you many hours of grief. They tell you how to do stuff. They tell you where to get the parts. The latest and greatest things in our hobby for digital TV, it happens there. <coughs> the repeater on Mount Diablo uses commercial transmitters and receivers. For an, a repeater site, that is the only way to go. The stuff's designed to run 24-7 forever till it breaks. And fortunately, it hasn't broke. It's been, what, up there two years now? Year and a half? About that, yeah. Yeah. Oh, and Jim, I didn't see you back there. Jim's also an expert at getting the station on here. Um, you know, that stuff was probably in the $20,000 range when it was new. Okay, I was being, trying not to shock the crowd. Um, needless to say, it was over 20,000 bucks new. We got it donated because we had a, uh, an angel passed over us and said, oh, you need this. So we have it. Um, modern, the modern gear that we have up there allows the system controllers to go up there and remotely program things. So if there's little changes that need to be made in the settings, it can be done <coughs> remotely. Well, how many of you guys have been to a mountaintop in your life? I know Mike has. <clears throat> Wouldn't you like to be able to make adjustments from the ground? Yeah. Amen. Yeah, well, we can do that with DATV when there's a, a, a path, a digital pathway and internet connection there. Um, what we call transmitter, the commercial stuff, we call pizza boxes. They're about the size of a pizza box. So that's the nickname that we give them, the pizza box transmitter set. Um, the prices are all over the board. Uh, now, Joel, you showed some really good prices today. Last, the other day when I looked, there was nothing less than 200 bucks, and that one was beat up pretty bad. Right. Right. Now, the thing about buying stuff like that off of eBay, you really don't know what you're buying. Uh, you don't know if it works. You don't know how much of it works if it does work. And you got no recourse. There's no manuals. You, don't, you do not possess the ability to repair it yourself. I promise you that. There's too much going on in there. And without a road map, you're not going to get from A to B. So, you know, you got to be careful. But it is out there. Um, you, whatever transmitter you choose, whether it's one of those... DATV express boards or this new thing that I'm going to talk about in a bit, you got to have an amp. So Down East Microwave, I don't know how many of you guys heard of them. They sell kits. They also sell a uh, built product. You can call up on the phone and they'll send you out a, a board. And you usually have it in a couple of days and you stuff all the parts on it and you're on the air. Or you can buy the whole thing and then wait six weeks and they'll send it to you. It's a rugged amp. The failure rate is low. And of course, that's what you'd want to use on the hill, only with a beefier heat sink, but you run the same stuff in your ham shack. There are project groups out there involved in the design and marketing of some very good products for hams to use. 
Where you find out about that information of what's out there is the British Amateur Television Club. Um, if you want to buy their products, you have to be a member of their club. They will not let you have the deal on what they're selling unless you pay them money to get on there. It's a scam, but hey, you know, sometimes you got to pay the piper. That is what the DATV Express Board looks like. Uh, I have uh, serial number 15. That's out of the original batch. I bought that one when they first started selling them. What you have is you've got a USB port going in, you got power, and then on this side over here is the SMA connector. This board is frequency agile, mode agile. You can tell it to run different modes, um, and you can also adjust the power output of that board. Anywhere from um, minus uh, 10 dBm all the way up to zero. Well, that doesn't sound like much, but in where we play, 10 dB is a, is a big jump. This little board here is what you need to capture video. That is the equivalent of a, of a MPEG-2 pizza box, this big. So you put video in, it gives you USB out, <coughs> that goes to the laptop, which does all the work. <coughs> This little board was that Digilite thing. I have one of these. These are very good transmitters, but they don't make that anymore. That was a $100 kit, and it worked great. We have two of them. One is uh, on Bear Mountain. The other one is the Spare, in case that one dies. So the DATV Express transmitter, it does require an external PC laptop. That's where it assembles the picture it takes the MPEG-2 video stream, it mixes it in with some other stuff, and it feeds it to the transmitter board, then then takes that transport stream in image, <clears throat> and then does stuff to it. That's where the Reed Solomon filter happens, or the Reed Solomon coding, and the Nyquist filtering all happens on that board. That Joel talked about Nyquist filters. Um, you can't eat your pudding if you don't eat your meat. You gotta have the Nyquist filter. You know, he's laughing because he knows what I'm talking about. Um, originally, that board ran on Ubuntu, Linux. A lot of guys go, ugh, not that bad. They did write a piece of software that runs on Windows 7 through Windows 10. I like it personally. It's got some issues with uh, video stability, but I think it's more based on that time reference thing that's up on Mount Diablo versus the actual software itself. They can't replicate our problem in Europe, so they don't know how to fix it. We're the only place in the whole world that has the little video instability problem, and we're running some oddball, goofy stuff up there that, that may be contributing to that. <coughs> you have full control over the camera and the settings uh, if you're using the, the uh, Windows-based program. You can adjust the zoom size, you can do all kinds of things with it if you're running the right software pieces. Unfortunately, that board is going to be going out of production. There is stuff on the horizon. Then that's the, one of the next things I'm going to talk to. Uh, the DTX-1 transmitter. It is a standalone box this big. I do have a picture of it in here. I'll get to that. It has the built-in MPEG-2 encoder and the modulator, everything in one box. You feed it video and sound, and it gives you RF out. You feed an amplifier and an antenna, and you're on the air. Fully programmable from the front panel, so you don't ever have to plug a computer into it. It's kind of a cool thing. It operates from 150 megs to 2 gigs, and it's optimized for the UHF band and the 1.2 band. That's where they peak the amplifiers to perform the best. It is a direct video feed device. You can uh, use a video switcher to switch camera inputs with it, just like we do now with FM, digital, and AM. Whatever you put in the video, it doesn't care, so you can still have that option. And it's uh, actually probably something that a lot of guys are going to end up switching over to. So we're going to look at some comparisons. That's the <coughs> little DVB transmitter that the BATC group sells. So those little five buttons there let you do everything. Uh, this particular one is set up for um, 1,000 megahertz, 
And that 69 is, uh, I think, is what the output power is, 69 milliwatts. All right, compare the cost. Those prices are going to vary depending on what you find, but let's say your average price of a laptop, I use the HP 6910. You can get those anywhere from 100 to 300 bucks on eBay. It's a dual core, it's a dual core um, Pentium mobile processor. That particular machine is a two gig <coughs> with four gigabytes of RAM in it, which Windows says, hey, you only have uh, 2.99 or something like that. You still need that video capture card. Nope. I saw a picture of that. And the DATV Express board. Well, you're looking at almost 600 bucks. The British exchange rate right now puts that DTX1 transmitter cheaper than what you could buy that system for in most cases. So it's not really a bad deal considering you're getting all of it in one little box versus multiple pieces like that. Yes, it's switchable from front panel, NTSC and PAL. I'll, I'll, I'll mention to say that, that uh, it's analog video. It's not like, um, right, it's analog video. Not, I don't know, this current form, it's, it's NTSC analog video, but they're always evolving. Um, <clears throat> I heard rumor that they're having uh, a version of that's going to come out with uh, USB connectors. You can plug a USB cam into it. That's kind of cool. Uh, again, um, I, we were recently informed that the D ATV Express transmitter is going to be discontinued, and they are looking at alternative solutions. There's something called uh, Lime SDR, which is... Uh, Software defined radio. It's a transceiver. It's fully and completely programmable. Right now, the guy that wrote all the software for the DATV Express board, um, his name is Charles Brain, and he is very smart. He's in Europe, in England actually. He is right now porting the software that he wrote for DATV Express over to run on this Lime SDR. And um, the board is about $300. I've been out to their website, and as they get more orders, the price of that board is going to be coming down. They don't know what it's going to come down to, but it is going to be coming down. And he, uh, Charles expects the software to be ready by the end of the year, so that, that could be a <coughs> another way to go. But again, it's going to depend on a laptop and a video capture card because it's USB-based. So it's going to be a replacement for the DATV Express, but you still need to run their software and have a video capture card device. So it's not a self-contained system. So again, even with that replacement transmitter, you might be better off just buying the fully self-contained unit and running that. I don't know anybody that has that yet, but the guys in Europe love them, and that's what they're all switching over to. That is what the Lime SDR transceiver looks like. That picture is, well, it looks big there, but it is probably this big. It's very small. And uh, you can get that in standard USB connector or micro USB. <coughs> what kind of power do you need to run DATV? Well, as regulations, we should be running only enough power to make the QSO. <clears throat> it's a good rule of thumb for HF and up, VHF and up. However, with DATV, there are concerns about propagation and interference. Just because you have line of sight to the hill doesn't mean it's going to see you. And there's all kinds of reasons. Radar. When Air Force One flies into town, you can forget talking on ATV on Mount Diablo because they turn that thing on at 12.55, that radar system, and it totally trashes the input to the repeater on the hill. Um, and then the output of the hill gets pretty badly trashed, too. You see little blips in your screen as that radar sweeps around like this. And you can time it. What is it, Bob? About every 1.2 seconds, it comes around and sweeps, something like that. So you've got that. You've got uh, uh, weather can affect it. Uh, when it was raining heavily, they lost the picture on Mount Diablo down the hallway here. So rain can attenuate it because 
of hydrogen. Water is mostly made of hydrogen. The hydrogen line is 1420 megahertz. That's where hydrogen resonates in the world of science. So that's a big uh, attenuator for 1.2. So in order to talk, you kind of need to know a few things. Where you're talking to, because you're going to be using a beam. You kind of want to know your path because you need to calculate the path loss. Uh, in order to calculate how much power you need to overcome the, the path loss, so there's some few things you need to know. You need to know the specifications about the far end, what his antenna is, what his feed line loss is, what his transmit power coming back to you is, what his preamp is, and what his receiver sensitivity is. If you don't know those things, you're shooting from the hip. So, oh, I didn't see you there. Hello, Mike. This guy here is very cool. He has a hat with an antenna on the top, a hard hat with an antenna. It's on the uh, PC Electronics ham site, hamtv.com. Great picture. Um, so you need to know those things. And so as hams, we tell each other what we're running. And the reason is, is because you write that down in your little notebook. So when you're going to do your path loss calculation, you know what to look for. It may turn out that you have to run more power than you have available to do that. Well, you can't get there from here. Uh, so you have the program. I wrote a program that actually does that. We'll talk about that in a bit. So to talk to the far end, you need to know what your station is, your power, your transmit gain, your feed line losses, any filter losses you have, and the frequency that you're operating on. And you need to pass that information along. <coughs> you need to get their information back. So you're going to exchange this information. <clears throat> There's the formula right there to calculate free space path loss. That doesn't take into account trees, buildings, clouds, fog, smoke, and alien intervention. Okay, All those things can affect the signal. But this, this formula is pretty accurate. It's been tried and true and proven over the years since radio has began. That little number at the bottom, the 32.44, that is a constant that they came up with for a really strange reason. They couldn't make it work without it. So what they did is they set up an antenna array and they knew that this antenna over here was gain X and that antenna over there was gain Y and they knew that the power over here was power X. When they looked at it at the other end, their numbers didn't add up. They couldn't figure out why. We know what this is. We know what the path loss is until somebody figured out the difference between this one and that one and it came out to be that 32.44. That is why that number is there. To this day, they do not know why the math doesn't add up so they jimmied the equation to make it work. You'll see different numbers in there depending on who puts the program or the, the uh, formula out. <coughs> but I got that from a guy that worked at uh, Decibel Products. They make antennas. He's the one that told me that. He's an antenna guru guy. And another guy uh, who's big in the, ham, in the ham world also told me that too. So I take it from two reliable sources that that was the reason for that. Of course, you need to know what your receive system information is in order to compute fade margins. We operate on fade margins. This is a microwave radio system. So you want to have as much fade margin as you can. Fade, fade, uh, fade margin is a di difference between minimum receive capability and what your standard operating signal is. So the more signal you have coming in up here and down here is your receiver, you want this gap to be big. So if something happens, atmospherics come up, the signal drops, you're still going to be in the sweet spot as far as your signal. So they call it fade margin. You really can't see that link because it's in blue. <coughs> but I have a, a link to my website, uh, http n 6 gkjlodiarcorg forward slash DATV tools. You go there and it'll bring up this web page full of links you can click on and it'll take you to an online calculator that I built 
for Mount Diablo. Since I know all the specs of Mount Diablo, it was pretty easy to, to do that. And you punch in your distance to the, to the hilltop, your receiver information, and you hit submit, and it will come back and tell you all the specs of everything, and it'll tell you the fade margin at the bottom. And as long as it's green, you're okay. If the fade margin comes up printed in red, you need to start over. So it knows that <coughs> I have the thing set up. If your fade margin is under 5 dB, start over. Because we don't know, I've never seen two receivers that are identical the same in receive performance. They're made in China on a robot thing that stamps parts on. We don't know the quality of the parts. Uh, they're made in the cheapest factory in China. So they vary and fluctuate all over the place. So uh, we've seen some that are as, as hot as minus 75 and some that are as deaf as minus 50. So I gave a 5 dB space there. If you're under the 5 dB fade margin, <clears throat> start over. And the way you improve that is with antenna gain or a better preamp. Like I said, repeater and simplex use. Right now there are three ATV systems. There's one on Mount Diablo near Concord. There's one in San Jose. Is that still on the air? Well, they're, they're, they have a um, 427 frequency AM. We were watching them. We were linked to them. on So whatever they were transmitting on 427, we rebroadcast it on Mount Diablo. <coughs> and then there's uh, Bear Mountain, which is uh, up above Valley Springs. It's a Lodi repeater. Mount Diablo is far the easiest site to get into. Um, I've done it with one watt and a 15 dBi vertical antenna at 25 feet with no line of sight to Mount Diablo. That is about as, as rough as it gets. And I put in a good signal. And um, I've never accessed a South Bay system, so I don't really know how it performs. So I'm not even going to really discuss that other than it is there. Uh, Simplex can be used as well. Um, I'd like to see some guys on mountaintops. We do it at 10 gigs. We make sideband contacts, and Joel does it. I do it. Maybe some of the other guys in here play at 10 gigs. Now, that's a rough, a rough shot sometimes. Hello, Amelia. Um, so there could be a contest to see how far you talk and how many guys you talk to. You do it with your HF rigs. You go out on field day. You go to CQP. You go out in the field. You run VHF contest rover out of your vehicle. Why not do the same thing with ATV? It can be done. The guys in Europe do it. They run contests all year long. Some of those guys win really nice prizes. I think they gave away an ICOM 7300 this year to their top guy for roving on digital ATV. That's some serious interest, you know. Um, so you can also talk on ATV across town. You don't have to go through a repeater. You could uh, do it on 427 AM. It's still a valid, viable mode. You can buy the cable transmitters down at the surplus place in Sacramento for 15 bucks. And it gives you minus 10 out. You dump that into a Mitsubishi 4, 440 brick, and now you've got you know, four or five watts of AM high power signal there. So it's doable. And you can also talk to the International Space Station as I talked to before. <coughs> Their system is up around 2.3 gig. Their downlink is on uh, 1.2, but I'm not sure where. They also have a, a higher up frequency uh, that they're going to be playing with later on in two years. It's going to be at uh, C band. It's going to be 3.34, I think, or 3.306, one of those two. Anyway, you can take this as far as you want, and uh, all you got to do is make a choice. If you stop and think about how much money you spend on an HF rig, Minimally, if you go buy a brand new one, you're going to spend minimally eight to nine hundred bucks, okay, on a brand new one. Now, if you go buy a used one, 
depending on what you buy and who you get it from, you're still looking at five to six hundred bucks and up for a used one. Can be more. I've seen some used radios that sell for more than brand new ones sell for, depending on what it is. So if you look at what you can do with it for how much money you're spending, it's the same. It's what you choose to do with it. You know, with, with uh, HF, you sit there in your headphones, you're listening, you're looking for that DX station. And on ATV, oh my gosh, he didn't comb his hair today. Oops, his dog came in and he spilled his beer. Seen that happen. Um, then Sunday mornings, it even gets better than that. What happens Sunday mornings, Mike? <laughs> the bathrobe net. Guy, you cannot be on the bathrobe net unless you come out in your bathrobe. So you got coffee cups, Bozo the Clown hair, and bathrobes. I don't drink coffee. I don't have a bathrobe, so I've never been on that net, but I've watched it. It's pretty comical. But there's some serious stuff that happens there. Halloween, yeah, the Halloween costume. Why, well, like I said, I take my mask off at Halloween. That picture was pretty close to it that I put up there earlier. But there are some serious stuff that goes on there. Freddie Co. WB6ASU. Most of you guys that are, a oh, everybody who runs ATV knows who Fred is. Um, Fred is a technical guy, <clears throat> no college education, no formal electronics background training whatsoever. Okay? Doesn't matter what it is, he doesn't need a book to fix it. He puts mojo on it, and it just works. He was my mentor. He doesn't always go with the modern, mainstream, conventional thinking, but he always gets there. And uh, he puts on a tech net on Tuesday nights, and some pretty interesting conversations happen there. And that's where the latest and greatest stuff we find out gets put out to everybody else. So. You can watch that on the stream that, that is streamed. Uh, what is it? W6CX-ATV forward slash live? No dash. No dash? Okay. W6CX-ATV forward slash live. And you can watch the stream. <coughs> Say again? Dot net. Thank you. Dot net. Yeah. Um, so you can watch the stream live. And... Um, you can go in there and just like any other IRC based chat room, you go forward slash name and you can put your call sign in there and speak, instead of being guest 101. So you, they know who's on. <coughs> and kind of that's kind of what's going on. So that's all, folks.